Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and it is my absolute pleasure to invite you to join us for the, our session three, to welcome you back to our session three, a conversation on improving food system governance by managing conflicts of interest. That's been a hot topic, which will be moderate, moderated by Sir George Allen, Director Emeritus of PAHO and ACC's patron. Uh, Sir George, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, I have a 10 minutes extra. I thought it was starting at noon, but I'm so glad to be with you all. First of all, let me congratulate uh, the Healthy Caribbean Coalition, Sir Trevor and Maisha, for a magnificent uh, event. The presentation so far have been absolutely brilliant. I want to thank them, and I'm sure the rest of the conference will go very well, very much like this. As Nicole pointed out, the conflict of interest is a very difficult issue, it's a very difficult topic. Uh, I used to teach it in one of my courses at Hopkins, and I always tell the students it's one of the more difficult things in public policy. Now, at a personal level, all of us know there are always conflicts of interest. Those of, who, those of us who've been married know that between two people, there are always conflicts, conflicts of interest. But I want to leave the personal aspect of it and deal with it in relationship to policy. And those of us who deal with public policy have realized that we can divide conflict of interest into two basic areas. There's the individual area and there's the institutional area. At the individual area, we often deal with public officials. Public officials, or uh, not only public officials, most professionals have a primary interest and a secondary interest. For example, a physician, a physician's primary interest is looking after his or her patients. His sec the secondary interest may occur when there are opportunities presented by uh, gifts being offered or uh, special uh, concessions being made that would influence his decision to pursue his primary interest, which is the well-being of his patients. And conflict of interest at the individual level often comes in the terms of public officials uh, dealing with uh, civil servants, dealing with policy issues, which is their primary interest being influenced by their secondary interest. And when their secondary interest overcomes their primary interest, then we have corruption in the public places. However, more of the attention recently has been placed on the institutional relationships and the conflict of interest that may arise through institutional relationships. And, relate, and in, in that respect, this has been one of the most difficult discussions that has occurred in all of WHO's history, how to deal with a conflict of interest. And what we have come down, at least WHO has come down to uh, believing, I'm not gonna give a lecture on this, that in the institutional arrangements, there always one must always focus on what is in the public good. So in this case here in our session today, we are dealing what is good for public health. What, that is the, our primary interest. What is good for public health? And what we must assure that that primary interest, what is good for public health, is not suborned by secondary interests of other players. And WHO has recently produced a, a, a six point uh, guide or toolkit, which sets out the following. When we are confronted with a problem, healthy food policy, we look at upfront what are the primary interests. The primary interest is supply good food, to healthy food to our populations. And then we look at the various uh, participants and we examine, in the case of the food industry, we examine carefully what are their interests. Is there any possibility of mutuality of interest between ourselves in public health and the food industry. And if we come to the conclusion that there is no possibility of managing that conflict of interest, then the only answer 
is confrontation. And the only answer is to try to block interference of the public of that industry in uh, damaging uh, 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 food. The case of tobacco is clear. The case of the arms industry is clear. If they examined what are their interests, we agree that there's absolutely no possibility of their interest being, their primary interest being pro the public health. So therefore, we can have no further dialogue with them. In the case of food, Dabichok points out is different. We have to examine very carefully what is their interest and to determine whether there's any possibility of achieving mutuality of interest, of managing that conflict in one or other part of their activities. And if there's none, then we have to take the view that the only answer then, then will be confrontation and try as best we can in the public sector to remove the possibility of there being in interference by the food and, and beverage industry. And that is the situation we are in the Caribbean. Is there no possibility of managing that interest? And if there's no possibility of managing that interest, shall we move to the phase of doing our best to uh, remove any possibility of interference? Now, having said that, I promise I, I promised I wouldn't give a lecture. We have a brilliant uh, a group of four, four persons on this panel who are going to explicate the situation. We have Dr. St. John, Dr. Joyce St. John, the Executive Director of the Caribbean Public Health Agency. Mrs. Barbara McGaw, who is the Program Manager uh, for the Heart Foundation of Jamaica. Ms. Kimberly Benjamin, who is a lawyer with the Healthy Caribbean Youth Advocates. And Julian Rogers, a, a distinguished Caribbean broadcaster and journalist. Most of you I know very well, so I hope you wouldn't take umbrage if I address you by your first names. Let me start uh, uh, with you, you, Joy, a director of CAFA. You have a vast experience in government, and you now have experience as heading the major Caribbean public health agency. In, 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 and, and, and you have always been wor working at the policy, in the policy, policy space. And from your experience, uh, in terms of what should be good governance, uh, is there any possibility of enhancing good governance by effective management of conflict of interest. Effective management of conflict, conflict of interest such that there is a positive outcome and there will be a win-win situation. Can you give us any examples from your experience as what we might, how we might think of managing conflict of interest in this dimension? Well, first of all, thank you, Sir George, for such a nice frame. And it was far from a lecture, but it is precisely those sorts of thoughts that went through my head when I came to CARFA. Uh, actually, today is the second anniversary of being um, the executive director. Those are the sorts of thoughts that came to my head when I started to take on the many challenges of CARFA. And when I saw what the landscape at the regional level for public health was like, and when I saw the drivers and the influencers of those who have power to make the policies that are necessary. And so what we did is we went about a change in our partnering policy with specific reference to um, this issue of conflict of interest not from the perspective of how do we manage it once it has happened, but also from the perspective of avoiding situations which will lead to conflict of interest. And then of course, laying out how we would deal with the conflict of interest if it so arises. We were so specific that we even have sections that deal with members of the board. And as you well know, Sir George, the members of the board are taken from the political the, and the technical and the administrative directorate of the ministries of health. So there has to be a level of sensitivity that allows that kind of due diligence that avoids um, situations that offend your, 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 um, your member states who have to pay your, your um, 
your quotas. And I really want to say that we also thought that it was, it should be framed in such a way that it could be applicable to the institution of the Ministry of Health and applicable to the person because most of the time at the regional level, we will deal with the top levels, um, the chief medical officer, the PS the minister, and we also would deal with heads of government, sorry, heads of department. So we needed to have this understanding of what happens in a ministry of health that there is a political dimension to all action and that we need to be able to allow a space for consultation, discussion, but not necessarily, unless mandated, a space at the table for certain sectors that may bring uh, either conflict or may actually disrupt the process. So our, um, newly approved and approved by the board, newly approved partnering policy is one of the concrete step-by-step -step ways that we are guided in these matters. But when it comes to an unknown situation, you have to use your common sense. But for me, the hard stop is that there should not be a partner at the table when policy is being decided on because that is a member state. We have the discussions before, but not at the time when policies mm. are discussed. Mm. Over. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Joy. I, I think you, you, you're phrasing it absolutely brilliantly. At the institutional level, you need to have these guidelines. You need to have these policies. And I'm so pleased that uh, one of the early things you did is establish the ethical guidelines that would gut as a Part the repetition, the ethical guidelines that would frame the kind of decisions your institution would have to, would have to take. Absolutely critical. I know uh, Barbara, I've known Barbara for many, many years. Uh, uh, Barbara, you have achieved a, a, a tremendous reputation in your work on tobacco, uh, your work uh, conquering the uh, oh, tobacco industry. And you are now engaged in uh, healthy food policy. And the question that we put to you, can you share the types of conflict of interest and industry, conflict of interest that you have encountered? How is that related to uh, the work you do to negate industry inter in in interference? And how have you faced any challenges in managing the conflict of interest that must have arisen in your dealing with the food industry and your new role in dealing with the food, with food policy. Okay, um, thank you, Sir George, and thanks to Healthy Caribbean for inviting me to this very important workshop. Well, those of us who worked in tobacco control know the usual playbook. Unfortunately or unfortunately, the food industry has copied several you know, of the tactics, such as delaying, pushing for longer consultation periods, uh, more research and evidence, um, threatening litigation. Um, quite a few of these we have already experienced within the, um, the project that we're doing at the Heart Foundation. Also to divide, to develop and promote their own labels that are generally stringent, argue for voluntary labels, attack every element, and of course, lobbying to stop regulations such as SSB and FOPL. Also deflecting, claiming the warnings will scare or mislead people. Uh, claims about the nutritional profile being too strict, you know, reframing the issue about the impact on business. And of course, denying, you know, that there's not enough evidence to make decisions, casting doubt on existing evidence, and arguing a lack of agreement globally on the most effective label. This is in re relation to the front of package. Governments have to lead the policy progress in order to counter the power imbalances caused by industry influence. That is the government responsibility to protect and promote the health of their citizens, including against conflict of interest. Um, you made an important point, Prof. You mentioned that it is in the best interest in terms of any policies around food. It's in the best interest of the population or the best interest of the country. I want to state that some of our experiences in Jamaica, some of the smaller manufacturers 
and even medium size are actually quite supportive of some of the moves. And they have actually asked for technical support to help them to reformulate or to help them to make you know, better labels. So I just want to make a point that there are, it's not a blanket, although the association, the manufacturers and exporters may have blanket um, comments or strategies um, individually, you may have you know, different responses. And one other point I want to make, which we learned from tobacco too, Prof, is to pick your battles. You know, there may be things at different levels. Um, you may not want to um, attack or attract every activity. You need to choose wisely which ones you want to respond to versus ones that, you know, are there and we know it's the natural play playbook. Thank you very much. Obviously, you've read Sun Yat-sen, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, strategist on how to pick your battles. <laughs> pick your uh, battles. <laughs> one of the things that uh, really, one of the things, many things you said that really pleased me is that the food industry is not monolithic. No. There are, there are uh, groups within the food industry yes. in which you can find uh, 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 symmetry of interest, mutuality yes. of interest. Yes. And then uh, in those, you uh, will want to explain to them and the possibility that they will influence other people and understanding that conflict of interest is not insuperable. No, that, it's that's not. Very good. Thank you very much indeed. That's a very important point that we don't necessarily think of uh, yes. putting everything in one back, except the tobacco industry. They are all- Of course, good. it was much clearer. Uh, then, <laughs> Ms. Ms. Benjamin, uh, who is a very recent uh, Radiant Law graduate, who is going to spend a lot of time thinking about obesity and how to counteract it, and does the, uh, our food policies promote obesity? Is there anything the law can do to assist in counteracting uh, this tendency to promote foods that are obesogenic. Would you like to share some of our thoughts with us, uh, Kimberly? Thank you, Sir George. Yes, sure. Um, good day, everyone. So I, I think we, we need to frame this discussion perhaps from the human rights perspective. And when it comes to the food policy, especially as it relates to children, we have clear guidance in the Convention of the Rights of the Child actually this international treaty, so it's a legal instrument, which all of the CARICOM member states have ratified, sets out the clear obligations of the state as it relates to the right to health of the child and other related rights. So the right to adequate nutrition, even the right to information. And there we have those binding obligations on the part of the state. Um, in this particular discussion, what becomes key is that obligation to protect. Um, and in, the, in a recent statement just last year in July by the UN Special Rapporteur, um, the statement made was that um, basically the obligation to protect requires measures. And in particular, he was spe specifying legal measure, measures, regulatory measures to prevent third parties from interfering with um, these types of policies that we're discussing today um, so that we can protect children's right to health and prevent violations from industry partners, industry um, players, sorry, and um, any actors of that sort. And so I think here in this particular discussion, Sir George, um, in relation to your question, there is a significant role to be played by law. Um, law acts as that almost it would give governments who have the primary responsibility of enacting legislation that leadership role. Um, and that's key. That's key in, in, in health policy. So especially in the context of food policies, because traditionally we've seen a lot of um, self or industry self-regulation and there's no evidence to show that that is effective. And so when we have clear laws with clear objectives, as you stated in your introduction, um, that kind of sets the premise, it sets the, the playing field for persons to engage and to interact. Because as you clearly stated, there's a need for some level of engagement, but there needs to be clear laws to dictate how that is to happen. And certainly in the context of the um, conflict of interest and industry interference, 
we need to establish those kind of clear rules of engagement um, for persons who have to collaborate. Thanks very much. That's very clear that uh, you're, you're, you're uh, like a good lawyer. You think that uh, all of us should be, if not, should be sensitive to the legal uh, possibilities for ensuring the public health good. All of us should be really uh, clear about that. We'll come back to that in a minute in the rest of the discussion. Uh, Julian, again, we've known one another for a long time, interacted for many, many years, and I have a tremendous respect for your, what you've done and what you're doing. Uh, the, the media is very, very influential. Uh, can you th share your thoughts of how the media could so frame the issue of conflict of interest such that there is an appreciation of what is in the public good and what are the primary interests to which we should all aspire and what are the, the, the issues that need to be uh, uh, explicated in order to ensure that that public good, that primary interest is uh, 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 reached. Do you think the media has a role in expl explaining all of this? First of all, let me let me say thank you to uh, Healthy Caribbean, and uh, let me let me let me say that it's very difficult to say no to two to two distinguished knights. So I'm happy to participate in this session today. The you you really you really give me a, a, a tough task there, but I will try my best because I think listening to the the panelists, uh, not just only in this session but but previously. Um, there's a clear man understanding of a mandate from everybody involved in the, in the health sector, but there's also clearly a mandate for the media in any of the development issues that we face. Um, since, I've, since I've been involved in the, in the media in, in terms of print and, and broadcast over the years, I've come to the conclusion that the media's role is twofold, particularly not just in the matter of reporting, in this case, health issues, but I think taking on a role of a development partner. I know that um, when we talked about development and the media in the context of back in the 1970s, for instance, um, it was regarded as a no-no and, um, and didn't get the kind of support that it really required. But I think we've come a long way now in terms of understanding what that role should be and that that role is not a political role, but a clear understanding that the media must become uh, experts, subject experts, if it is to play the kind of role that you'd expect. And I have been trying to urge uh, journalists in particular to try to embrace the development issues that we have in the Caribbean whether it is health um, in particular. And I think that the, the, the arrival of COVID on our doorsteps has reinforced the value of that kind of partnership. And that partnership really raises the question that you raised earlier, uh, Sir George, in terms of the conflict of interest. That conflict really is one in which the media as an, as an instrument of information and education must not see itself in conflict with the interest that may be described as political uh, on the government side. And I think that I'm happy to report that in a lot of instances, as, as I track the, the media's coverage and reporting and, 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 and communication role within the context of COVID has been far more consistent than I've seen in, in many years. I think that the, they've risen to the particular occasion uh, and I will say to you, for instance, that where government ministries have gone on campaigns of public, public information, the media themselves have also picked up the ball and been involved in creating the kind of instruments of education that are very critical to the society and the, and, and the condition, the health condition of our countries. So I would think that we've seen some progress, but I think that we always have to be reminded that there is the possibility of a conflict if we do not clearly identify our roles and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And the media must point out those things and say, look, 
it is important that everybody understands these particular issues in the matter of health, and I talk about health in particular. Um, we've long been partners, for instance, as I as I listen to to Barbara talk about about the anti-smoking campaigns, etc. Media houses long time embraced, uh, even before there was legislation, for instance, to insist that they would not accept uh, tobacco advertising. It's been, you know, it it, it would have represented a, a healthy chunk in our in our portfolios, for instance. We've got the same thing with alcohol, for instance, and the and the and the and the point of not running particular things within particular hours, etc. So I think we have first steps, but there may be a requirement, and I would say there are requirements for further steps. But I see those steps being undertaken in a clear partnership between the media and the development interest. And I think I come back to the point of us becoming real subject experts if we are to deliver on the kinds of things that you expect or that we should be doing. Thanks so much. Uh, Julie, I'm gonna come back to you in the, in the second round. I'm going to pose it to you this way. We are talking about food and food policy and we are all added them in terms of what is healthy food policy. We speak of the private sector not having with us a mutuality of interest. I'm going to ask you if the healthy pub food policy is in the public interest, does the media itself have a conflict of interest in promoting a healthy food policy? I'll let you think about that and come back to that in a minute, because I think if we're going to succeed in the Caribbean, that is one aspect I think is going to be critical for the media to accept what is the ultimate public good and what role they can play in assuring that ultimate public good. And is there a conflict of interest? Do they have themselves have a conflict of interest in ensuring and pursuing that public good? I'm going to come back to you again in the second round. I'm going to go back to Joy because Joy, you ended by uh, your presentation by saying something that was very teasing in a sense. Do you think that CAFA as an institution has a role in supporting ministries, uh, ministries, ministers come and go, in supporting ministries of health in managing conflict of interest? Do you see that as one of the roles that an institution like yours can play, and especially in relationship to food policy? Joy? You see ministers, that yes, ministers may come and go, but on a daily oh, basis. Please, you mean forever. No, 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 no. <laughs> but on a daily basis, I interact with ministers and not just ministers of health. If I was just having a WhatsApp conversation with one. And so our role in supporting this issue is first to highlight what are the pitfalls. And what are the boundaries that we recommend? Remember, CARFA is going to be playing a role of advising even before we are asked in some cases, and which is what we do. So in this particular context, we would want to outline the situation, outline the boundaries of all the parties and outline the pitfalls and suggest or recommend ways in which to deal with it. If those, those recommendations are not followed, then we have also been playing the role of how best do we get a win-win out of this unpleasant situation? Yes. And most of the time, our role is to advise and not to get into the situation and try to manage it. Because at the end of the day, we are about what the member states want and we support by telling them, well, we don't say it like this, but we tell them this is foolishness. Mm -hmm. It's better to go another way or yes, this is excellent. These are some ways in which it can be improved. The other thing about our regional role is that we look not at country by country or, or a subnational context. We try to have the, the regional context. And for us, our member states are a bit wider than CARICOM. So we also um, 
are measuring what we are hearing is going on in different parts of our CARICOM region. As small as we are, there are geographical differences in the way we respond. And so we measure what we are seeing and advise in a way that one country is not um, disadvantaged or has an, a, a more of an advantage than others. It is not easy, but this is what we try to do, Sir George. It is not easy. I can, I, uh, uh, and it is not easy. I can imagine it is not easy with uh, so many masters, as it were, it is not constituents, as it were. In the area of food policy, uh, sorry to, to, to go along this line again, in the area of food policy, do you see a special, uh, a, a good public policy, whether it is food or another area, or we're dealing with food now, the area of public policy, do you see that there's so much divergence in the region that CARF is going to play a special role and trying to achieve coherence in terms of that public policy and managing the conflicts of interest that might arise in order that uh, they, we might all move in that, that's, that, that one direction, that direction of ensuring healthy food policy. But Sir George, you know that we started and have recently recommenced a process where there is an intergovernmental working group looking at healthy diets and alcohol. And CARFA is part of the um, secretariat that supports those member state groups. And so it's not just health in that group, it's also trade. Okay. And so we actually have been put in a position by the CARICOM process to do just that, to do that advising and guiding and enlightening and educating. And hopefully the process will allow for regional movement because oh. the NCD situation is not getting any better. Okay. And I, it's worsening COVID-19. I agree. I agree. Thanks very much. That's very helpful. Uh, Barbara, you, 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 you mentioned uh, uh, in general uh, civil society. Do you think that civil society, as you know it, like building on a, your experience, has to play a role in helping to manage this conflict of interest and help to play a role in uh, uh, where there is the similarity of interest, for example, in terms of food and beverage industry and helping to bring them on board as it were. Do you think a civil society has a role? Um, we definitely have a role. Um, again, coming off the tactics of the tobacco industry so we know how to respond. As I mentioned earlier, um, we have to pick our battles, but um, we have to be the watchdog to ensure that the policies are protected for the industry interference and have co close communication with the ministries, departments and agencies, of course, not just health. Um, one of the things that we started in our, in our project since 2017 is to have journalism training. We have had so far three Annual, so three years in a row, we did journalism training with editors, senior editors, and we incorporated University of Technology, NCU, and UW, UWI media and communication departments. And what we did find, because you talked about subject experts, after the first training, what we found was a reporting of, in, of areas around food policy that first one might have been SSV tax, we found more effective and correct information being shared. So that was important to us because um, you want to make sure that the, the, the data that goes out is accurate. Okay. And since then, we have had times where journalists have contacted us and said, listen, I'm doing a story on so-and-so. We are seen as a resource where we can actually share information. Um, we have done a, several sensitivity, sensitizing meetings with ministries, departments, and agencies. Um, at the time, conflict of interest wasn't a huge, it was mentioned, but not fully. In fact, we had a plan for a large conference around March or April of this year, but because of COVID, you know, that was, um, that was put off. 
And we, the other thing too, we work one school at a time, one bank at a time. What we found, we got a lot of requests from small organizations. Come and tell us about healthy eating. Come and tell us how to do this. And he said, this will help with the public sway when it comes to our policy decisions, you know? So yes, so we you, have to be there watching out, Sir George. So you, you, so you do plan that uh, when you have these sensitizing uh, workshops or training, you will really include the issue of conflict of interest. Oh, definitely, most definitely. But I want to give you an Go ahead. I wanted to give you an example. We did similar when we were in tobacco, and I remember us doing a particular ministry and talking about conflicts and giving examples. And the staff there were getting T-shirts for their netball team from the tobacco industry, but they never looked at it as a conflict. Yeah. They were so happy. So George to get stuff and it's, it's like they went, oh, wow, you know, and that particular ministry had some input into tobacco legislation and other issues. So you wonder when that time comes, if there would be any, you know, conflict, so to speak. So, yes. What you've said there is an example that all of us should take to heart. We know what our primary interest is, yes. and sometimes you don't recognize the secondary interests. We don't recognize that giving t-shirts is a part of the secondary interest. And yes. uh, sometimes you don't quite appreciate the power of the secondary interest wielded by those persons who don't share our primary interest. Exactly. I think it's a very important point you make that mm -hmm. you have to point out to people that watch right. out, watch out for what the secondary interest might be and how they may conflict. And in the case of the food and beverage, in the case of the uh, food policy, that also obtains, be very careful, what are the secondary interests that might impair your ability to uh, have uh, what, achieve what is basically we all wish, which is a healthy food policy. Yes. So we'll come back to that because that's very important to recognize, recognize that. And Ms. Benjamin, you spoke earlier on uh, about uh, the role of the, the, the law, and you spoke as a, a, a lawyer, but I'm going, you are the youngest of us on this panel, and I'm going to ask you, as a, a young person, what role you think you and your colleagues at your tender age can play in influencing policymakers and getting them to understand that they have to be very careful of the secondary interest impairing their possibility of achieving the primary interest, which is a healthy food policy. What do you think you, uh, the, the role of young people can be? Okay, I think young persons, because we are the, we are the rights holders. When you look at the convention again, we are the rights holders. We are the main beneficiaries, so to speak. And I'd used that analogy on a previous HCC webinar that as the beneficiaries, you know, it's in our interest to ensure that there's something left for us, that we remain, that we are healthy, um, that there's a future for us. And so the role that young persons have to play, I think it has to be a participatory one. We must, um, we must engage at the policy level. We must be given that opportunity to engage, to contribute in whether it's a consultative process or whatever mechanism is used to, to garner citizens' opinions um, on the policies and so on. I, I know the examples that we have from around the world. Um, we, we see the, you know, the Greta Thunbergs of this world and how young persons have basically created their own platform to engage and to make sure that government pays attention. And whilst in the Caribbean, we, we may not come from the same cultural context, um, actually in the Caribbean, children have always been told, you know, you're to be seen and not heard. And so we have that additional hurdle to cross as young persons that what we say is important and it matters. We're, we, we are the best persons who can talk about um, the policies that will affect us. And so I think for, for young persons, that level of engagement is key. We must be given those spaces. And if, if we're not given them, if, if they're not created by the state or by other actors within society, we must create them ourselves. Um, and we have, like I said, we have those examples um, around the world. Just this year as well, I was personally <laughs> healthy Caribbean youth and 
you know, taking part in a silent process. And I just felt invigorated by that particular activity and saw the value in it as a young person. So I, I think that there's several aspects in which young persons can be engaged. It's of course raising awareness as it relates to the conflict of interest aspect. We must help to identify where, you know, there are those clear cases of conflict and, and where industry is deliberately interfering. So young persons again can be actively involved in calling out those instances. We're all engaged on social media, on the Facebook platforms, on um, Instagram. And so we see them. We know we know we can recognize the the activities of industry and it and is a and it's a important to, to call them out, call them out for what um, they are and to apply that pressure because quite frankly, the NCD womb is bleeding. And so we need the youth engagement to continually apply pressure to, to highlight when there are these conflicts and, there, and there's this interference, because at the end of the day, it's, it's those policies, it's those um, pieces of legislation that we need to have in place to protect our future, to ensure that as beneficiaries, and I'll close how I began, as beneficiaries, there's something remaining for us and that we remain at the end. You know, Kimberly, as you spoke, I remember my professor of surgery said, when it's bleeding, the first thing you do is apply pressure. Apply pressure first. But you mentioned that uh, in the old days, when I was a little boy, if children should be seen and not heard. You all don't have that problem now, because as you mentioned, your social platforms are so ubiquitous and so far reaching, you don't, you, you can be heard without being seen. Uh, and I like very much your idea is that you can use these platforms to keep hammering in what is it at the primary interest. A healthy food policy should be the goal. That is our primary interest. And we will not brook conflicts of interest. We will not brook other interests that impede our possibility of reaching that primary, that primary interest. Right? Uh, uh, Julian, you've had time to think of the question I posed to you of whether the media themselves, whether there's a conflict of interest within the media in supporting what this conference is all about, a healthy food policy. Uh, is there a conflict? Do you envisage that being possible or that, or that uh, exists? I, don't, I, can't, I can't see how it could be counter to the interest of the media um, to go against the, the, the intentions of, of a gathering such as this or or this, or this particular thrust. Um, and I, I will just say that I'm happy to hear Barbara's confirmation of the value of the deepening of the knowledge of the journalists in particular areas where it converts into them, the journalists making the call uh, in doing the research, etc. I think that reinforces the point that it is in the media's interest. Um, and there, there, there are two elements in, in the media interest. There's obviously a commercial interest. Uh, and of course, there's the content interest. On the commercial side, uh, I noted, for instance, the, the point made earlier also by Barbara about the recognition that, yes, it's very easy to find sponsors to do things, but those sponsorships uh, are in conflict. And therefore, the people need to be sensitized to that and continuously sensitized because you're really up against a phalanx of interest who really want to convert you in, in and take you in a different direction, which is really in conflict with the overall interest, as the case may be. I think that the, it, and, I, and so I reinforce the point that it is not in our interest as a media, as media institutions to go against this, this particular thrust. And I'll explain why. Um, there are many, there have been several instances where people have come to media houses and say, we want you to support a particular project. And then when we realize that it is really going down a road that really makes no sense, uh, the temptation though is strong because there's commercial value. Uh, you know, there's money to be earned and, uh, and these are not easy times, et cetera, for media operations. But I think we always have to be on guard about that. And it is in the hands of the managers to recognize those kinds of of, 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 uh, of appeals and a combination of threat, et cetera. Um, I think that we really need to be strengthened by better understanding of the value of these particular directions that we're talking about. Obviously, 
if we have a healthy audience, we then have a healthy marketplace in which to present our products. And that is the way that I put it down. Because if the, and, and we, we can use COVID as an example, media houses across this Caribbean have gone through, particularly in the print industry, where we started off with the early references that, oh, COVID can be caught by touching the newspaper. So we don't want to buy any newspaper because, you know, we'll, we contract COVID, et cetera. Thank God the WHO issued an early indication that that was not true, but we suffered and, uh, and, and we, we can recount those particular stories. But I think that the responsibility on our side is really to keep educating our populace about these situations. Mm -hmm. And I will point out that where it may seem that an institution such as yours or even a commercial interest who are doing like a PR job, et cetera, there is an opportunity to make that distinction and to communicate and say, okay, look, I understand the message you want to deliver. We can work with you in getting that message out. But at the same time, just ensure that we are not doing a PR job for you. Let us, let us take that original information that you're presenting to us. Let's sit down and work through it so that we feel comfortable in delivering the message because mm -hmm. it is about delivering the messages. And right. if we have a conflict in our, in our hearts, the boy really and truly, this is not the right thing for us, then we need to, we need to clarify that, get that out of the way, et cetera. I think, so George, in a lot of ways, the media is overwhelmed by the volume of information that is available. And they really need a hand in really deciphering in some cases, or narrowing down the kinds of messages that are vital. Um, and you know, I, I come back to the COVID situation. I've had somebody say to me, look, uh, I'm gonna go off to the States and I'm gonna get the Pfizer vaccine. And I say, but hold on, if you're going to the States, you come back, you have to quarantine and whatever. Oh, why don't you go for the one shot, the Johnson & Johnson? Oh, no, 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 no. The Johnson & Johnson is only 20% efficacy. And I said, where do you get that from? Yeah. That's not true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we That's, really, we we have we really have a job in those in in those areas of communication, mm -hmm. and the, the media is up to it. But I know that sometimes you're overwhelmed. We we not enough staff in in another mm -hmm. media houses, etc. But the more help we can get, the more we can be partners. Thank you very much. But uh, one point I would make, uh, following on your last comment, I think I can assure you, on behalf of the Healthy Caribbean Coalition, that any time the media wants information in whatever form, shape, or size it is needed, the Healthy Caribbean Coalition can, can provide it. And that I can guarantee, that I can guarantee. Yeah. We're coming that's, that's close my, to that's the end. That's been my experience, no problem. We're coming close to the end, as is my habit. I'm going to ask, give each panelist one minute to make any closing comment they would wish to make. One minute. Uh, 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 Joy, may I start with you? Uh, you have one minute to make any closing. You may decline. A one minute to make any closing comment you wish to make. Have you ever one. heard me decline to speak, Sir George? Well, thank you for the opportunity. And I just want to tell Mr. Rogers that he can come to CARFA too. If he right. hasn't already seen the messages we've been putting out, especially um, in the cricket space. So the conflict of interest of interest issue <clears throat> is not going to be, going to go away. It's going to get even more complex. And I urge um, those who support policymakers, like I used to, when I was chief medical officer, to get their frameworks and to get their support. CARFO will support um, with that partnering policy and an adaptation that will be relevant. And I also want people to understand that we can no longer hide from certain groups. Of course, tobacco industry is out, okay. but there are certain groups um, that we still have to engage, but to a limit. Okay, thank you very much. Barbara, you have your golden minute. Thank you so much. Um, just to confirm again, it's not a homogenous group. The industry is made up of several levels and we may need to adjust our our behavior or our you know, support. Just recently, we have done a set of four reformulation webinars. 
So we are offering through the Scientific Research Council and uh, the Food Industry Task Force and several small and medium um, manufacturers contacted, they thought it was excellent and they asked for more support. So when you can, you know, diversely um, support, um, I just want to say for media too, I understand the challenges because there's a dollar to be made. But what I ask for is the point, um, point counterpoint. We have had a couple of cases where an article is written, no discussion was made on the public health side, you know, just okay. what was the industries. And usually it's good to be balanced. But I understand their concern because the food industry is a huge funder, you know. Okay. But I think this kind of collaboration we have is going to be very important Thanks. towards solving our challenges. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kimberly, your minute. Thank you, Sir George. So I think we are clear that there's a multi-sectoral action required for the NCD problem, which is so complex. I think we're also clear that law provides that framework for engagement um, in terms of including how disclosure should be done, the rules of engagement, um, when, you know, what, what information needs to be provided. And also for the youth aspect, um, it's, for, it's important to recognize their voice needs to be heard and as well um, important to recognize that actually the Convention on the Rights of Children stipulates that children should be involved in that policy, you know, that policy discussion. Okay. Um, their rights. Thank you very much. And Julian, your minute. Well, I, just, I would just say I'm happy to hear all of the, uh, all of the panelists uh, make the point of the value of collaboration with the media. We're open, and I know we have commercial interest, but at the same time, I think we have a developmental interest to fulfill, and happy to do so. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I want to thank the panelists for a very stimulating discussion. I've uh, learned a lot. I see plenty of people. Joanna, how are you? I've seen plenty of people, my friends in the panel. I like the comment in the, in the panel about uh, principle before uh, principles and people before the lure of money. I like that comment in the chat very, 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 very well. I, I, I thank you very much. I, I leave here and I, I think we've all uh, agreed on what is the, 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 the principal interest, what is the primary interest for us in, the, in public health, the primary interest is a healthy food policy to ensure the health of our people and what is consequent upon the health of our people, as all you have said, the development, etc. We are all at one about what is our primary interest. And I think we are all aware of what are the possibilities of secondary interest impacting negatively on this primary interest. We are all aware of what has to be done to manage that conflict of interest or when that conflict of interest is not manageable, what are the efforts we must make to overcome the objections to what our laudable primary uh, interest is. I take a lot of comfort from a lot of movement I have been seeing at the industry level. Milton Freeman from the Chicago School always made the point that the whole goal of a business was shareholder interest shareholder interest. Milton Freeman and you, more schools of business would uh, emphasize that it is shareholder interest that was important. And now I've been pleased to see groups of uh, CEOs pointing out, oh, oh, that may not be the whole story, but there's also stakeholder interest that we also have to take account of stakeholder interest. And business now Many business people are starting to say, hi, it is not enough to ensure profits and shareholder interest. We also have to be good social partners and we also have to ensure that there's stakeholder interest. And if, we, if this kind of attitude uh, flourishes, then I think it is possible that we will see uh, less heat in terms of managing the conflict of interest uh, between institutions which have as their primary interest, and I repeat that, their primary interest, healthy public policy, and will have less attempt to downplay the, 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 the
the secondary, we have more enthusiasm for taking account of those secondary interests and finding ways to negate those secondary interests. So thank you all very much. I, I, it is not an easy topic that which I'll spend years is the most difficult topics that which I have to deal with and trying to uh, establish some ground rules for managing relationships with what they call non-state actors uh, and health had all to do with how you manage conflict of interest. So thank you all very much. And now let me hand over to Maisha Hutton for continuation of the program. Thank you. Maisha. Thank you, Sir George. Thank you very much. Maisha. Thank you, Sir George. What a wonderful panel.